So you mean to tell me some goofy pickup guy figured out what the Fountain of Youth was? Come on. Uh, if you haven't seen the previous episodes, the playlist is down below. Feel free to give it a link or give it a click. Give it a watch. There's seven chapters or seven essays coming up in this section. It starts with Fountain of Youth. Kill that desperation. Embrace your sexuality on embracing sexuality, whether you should eliminate desire or not, on being shy, and we ended off with the nature of sexuality. So if you're new to this one, Pook was a pickup guy on the SoSwap forums, and he had kind of done his journey, gained a bunch of muscle, started getting more attractive, started being less unattractive, and then started writing down his thoughts. He added a nice literary flair to this, because if you don't know, for most of the guys that talk about dating, and relationships and that stuff. They talk about it like it's an auto mechanic how-to manual. It's very artistic, very instruction-based. If A and then B do C. He took a different approach. It's more like the way you would read a book. You'd see a bunch of flared language. You'd see a bunch of allegory. And from that, you kind of have to be smart enough to read between the lines, learn when he's being serious, when he's not being serious. We'll just get into it now. So we'll start here on the Fountain of Youth with a quote. If not, then you know what you need to do. You have come to the solution of your Don Juan troubles. Doesn't this clear the stormy air of confusion, especially with younger immature women? When you're with a woman and a thousand Don Juan philosophies and tactics come to thwart your peace, Remember that kid you were and how he looked on life. Yes, she may be a 20-something vixen, but underneath those milk sacks and fat deposits that drive your chemicals mad is a little girl. Rather than being nervous about some date, view the date as if you were seven years old. Everything becomes simple and fun as it should be. And one thing is for certain, women go nuts over a guy who keeps his boyhood charm as women want an escape. They do not want to hear your views on the world. They want to have the happiness and fun on their childhood as everyone does. They will fight for the rare men who truly live like this. And this also explains the mystery as to why uneducated men seem to do better with women than many men with PhDs who are so smart they intellectualized life out of existence. And he ends with, This isn't about bringing your childhood into the present. It's to cleanse your mind and soul of the philosophic dust and bitter memory garbage that has accumulated. We cannot reverse time with our bodies thanks to the cell division error, but we can drink from this fountain of youth for our own minds. And with one sip, the complexity of women just vanishes. With two sips, you no longer want to talk and intellectualize with girls, you just want to run around and have fun. And with three sips, you look at all these manifestos of women and how women, how to get women with disbelief. The fountain of youth is not immaturity, it's not mediocrity. So it's a nice story he tells here about if you just look in the past, you're going to see a guy who understood woman. And he says, look at yourself when you're six years old. That was kind of the thing where you, when you were six, you understood that men and women are different, that girls were dangerous and give you cooties. You knew that the clothes your mom gave you to wear at school weren't very good. It ends up, you have to like train the ability to be naturally attractive out of a man. And so what he's suggesting here is just go back to being playful and childlike. Again, it, it ties in with so many different concepts. Nagging, which I'm sure you've heard before, is just playful teasing. Now, who's the guys who tend to playfully tease the most? You know, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. Absolutely vicious teasers. But that's the kind of behavior that people enjoy, especially as they get older. I mean, everybody's got bills to pay. Everybody's got things to do, responsibilities. Life is hard. Their boss sucks. And that girl from accounting is a pain in the ass. Just having a guy around who's not boring and offers some escapism. It's an amazing superpower. Like even for older guys, like when I was working uh, corporate, I remember there was always like one or two girls there that were, I guess, chronically single. They were always on dates and they were always doing things. They never liked any of the guys. They always had some problem with it and they ended up being forever alone. The part that got me was they weren't dating because they wanted to find the true love. They weren't dating because they wanted to find a husband. They weren't dating because they were promiscuous, although I'm sure they were. They were dating because it was something to do with their week. And it's funny, just not being boring 
because that's all a lot of people are looking for. A lot of adults just don't want to be bored anymore. They have boring lives. They have boring conversation. And yeah, men and women alike, if you can be an interesting person when you're out and about, world's your oyster. Kill that desperation. So where I work, I ask the women why they found a coworker to be so desperate. And here are some of their answers. He's always given women attention. He's always calling all the time and calling immediately once getting the number, immediately returning a call, etc. Taking every opportunity to talk to them and tell everything about themselves. Always available. He's never willing to walk away, disagree, he's always supplicating, etc. So what theme can we find in the above? It is that the man puts the woman on the pedestal rather than himself. And they talk about a bunch of qualities in here that are good to have. Uh, good looks, humor, dominance, and ambition. The reason he's talking about desperation here, and it's been kind of like a neat little theme you're going to see in the next couple chapters, is desperate guys don't know what to do, so all they know how to do is focus on themselves. They actually act solipsistic. And again, men acting like broken women. Obviously, girls are the solipsistic gender between the two of us, and so when you get guys acting like that, it's naturally seen as unattractive. You're basically putting yourself in the friend zone by acting like a girl. He continues on with, I think it's best to treat a chick, no matter how hot and steamy she is, no matter how cute and perfect, as a guy. The only exception is don't talk technical stuff with them like you would a guy. You know, computers, cars, how to lay chicks, etc. And they'll love this. With the girls that I like, I talk about them, and they become more and more attracted to me because guys do not do this. The Art of Conversation is a great article at SoSuave. She flaps her gums, you take something you said, or something that she said that you agree with it, paraphrase it in your own words, and feed it back to her. She will levitate before your very own eyes. Uh, I haven't read The Art of Conversation, but I do know this one from Mystery Method. It's and even just general conversation, for the most part, people like to talk about themselves. It's the topic they know the most on, it's the thing they're most passionate about, and it's the thing that they know best, even if it's not true. So a lot of the times when you're out with a girl, they don't want to hear you talk about yourself. They don't. They want you to be a mystery to unsolve. There's a reason why they'll get on Netflix and watch a 15-part serial killer series when the end result is, well, the guy went to jail. Like, if you'd started off with, this guy went to jail, and here's your 13-part series, nobody would care about it anymore. You always have to be kind of unsure. The other thing to know, and this is what I learned way back from dating, is that building rapport, for the most part, is just about using more words. The more words that somebody uses with you, the more comfortable they are with you. It's almost like uh, the Ben Franklin effect. If you haven't heard about this one, it's where... If you do somebody a favor, they always feel indebted to you, and it tends to build resentment. But if you have somebody do you a favor, then they tend to like you more. Because, well, I must like this guy if I was doing a favor. Think of it along those lines. Talk about yourself to me. As long as you're willing to talk, I'm willing to, I'm willing to listen. As they tell you things, you show a genuine interest. And yeah, I get it. A lot of people have boring lives, and a lot of people don't have interesting things to talk about. That's fine. You can always do some playful teasing. You can always ask some probing questions. Heck, you can always just assume some things that didn't happen that are so fantastical that it at least makes it sound more interesting than the truth, and then they can walk you back to reality. Either way, you just have to kill that desperation. Don't talk about yourself. Don't be needy, and don't always be available. It's a great section. I would suggest you guys read this stuff, by the way. These crib notes do not do it justice. Uh, the next part's embracing your sexuality. It's kind of a two-parter. And he talks about three different reasons that uh, guys have a hard time embracing it. He basically says guys act androgynous. The nice guys, the average frustrated chumps, or AFCs is what they used to call them. Constant issues with not being masculine and not embracing the fact that they like sex. And sex isn't a big deal. And it's not bad. So the problem one, looks. It's well known that women like guys who have some feminine aspects. Pretty boys. So to get the Brad Pitt effect, you need to figure out where you are on the sexuality scale. Though many guys, like Nerd Boy, aren't on the scale at all. If you're a feminine male, you're probably thin, innocent, modest, shy, pretty boyish, curls for hair, large eyes, and have an almost aristocratic style about you. The masculine male is muscular, large, loud, 
motorcycle, has a goatee or some shadow, and a sporty or outdoorsman style to him. So now that you know where you are, simply add in elements of the other. Some guys, when they go on to manhood, carry a piece of adolescence with them. These are the guys that end up with the Brad Pitt effect, although you can make it your own. Again, this is because you see cases like glam rock used to be the biggest thing. David Bowie, Prince, very feminine looking, got all the girls, right? But that's all that it was. They took what they had about themselves, very effeminate looking. And then they just add a little bit of the, uh, the masculinity side to it. Or some guys ultra, ultra masculine, you know, what you would think of an ax, flannel, shaved head, beard, all that stuff. Maybe they have a love for the arts something else about them that makes them a little more feminine and just having that little bit of a dichotomy gives what they call in here the brad pitt effect which is essentially being acting feminine but being masculine enough to get away with it or acting feminine but having enough masculinity to get away with it and either way just tends to make you more attractive but then problem two personality uses an example here bad the bad example hi i'm flirty boy touch touch you look so cute in that outfit. My goodness, you must get compliments all the time. And the flirty boy continues to flirt. The right answer is, hi, I'm Mr. Right. A little bit of small talk. What's your number? A guy does not flirt with chicks unless he's working, thus captive, and has nothing other else better to do to occupy his mind. A guy asks the chick out to show he's interested. Now, this is a very crude example. I would not go asking a girl out to dinner. Um, but... And he's going to get to the point of this later, but to sum it up quickly, it's the idea that what you think of as flirty and attractive is likely uncalibrated if you're a nice guy, if you're not super successful. So don't hit on girls. Once you know what you're doing, then you can do it again. But like I said, for the average guy, and he's like here for the nerdy guy, the stuff that worked for him was be more direct and be less needy. And he goes on to problem three, dating. This is where I have a great essay on this one. Watch it. It's Red Pill Coffee on dinner dates being for chumps. And he talks about Nerd Boy and his chick eating a meal. But Nerd Boy, I'm sorry to interrupt. How are you different from any other male? Look, there goes your woman, never to talk to you again. She said you were boring. Oh, but I gave her dinner. She ought to like me. But any guy can give her dinner. Can you give her dinner, trash heap guy? Yes, Pook. I can buy her dinner. And what about you, Mr. Nice Guy? It's like, I can also buy your dinner. And Mr. So Suave, what can you do? I can also buy your dinner. There's no difference. Any guy can buy her dinner. Heck, any girl can buy her dinner. And so what do you suggest, Puck? Action dates. Don't just sit there talk, talking and eating. She can do that with her girlfriends. Guys are all about action. Real men are not making dinner. They're swimming rivers and climbing mountains. Find something action-wise to get her involved. I have a book. I enjoy sitting in front of my computer all day and I don't like action dates. Well, learn to like them. Are you even living if you don't? There are brilliant things out there to enjoy and do. And why are you wasting your youth on what? Sitting in front of the computer? It's funny. There was like a, an age old argument about uh, whether you should take a girl on a dinner date for the first date, which it and this stuff was crude back then. He was just like, have something to do, not just someplace to talk. And you kind of want a bit of both, but it's since kind of advanced within the red pill spaces to where you have a logistics plan somewhere public like a park go for a walk chit chat up make sure the person's not crazy then you switch it up to maybe you're walking to go somewhere get a coffee something really quick then you start doing a little bit of escalation you see if there's sexual interest and if it goes well then you escalate that to maybe to a pub or to a party or an event something that's not super committed because as soon as you start committing to it it comes across as clingy and then take it from there. But the point of all of this was you can't just sit there and eat dinner because then that puts the focus on her. She's like, well, he fed me and now he probably thinks he's entitled to something. Most guys don't actually act entitled towards anything after a dinner date, but the girl assumes they do. And so she sabotages the event because she hates being put on the spot. She hates being obliged. Remember what I told you before, Ben Franklin effect, just like that here. So again, have something to do, have a plan, don't go out to dinner. Don't be boring. Charles Bukowski. Jordan Peterson. Neil Strauss. I like these guys. Add some salt to cover up the bitterness of middle-aged soccer moms and put in the oven for 45 minutes. Optionally, you can take from all this stuff what you want and leave the rest. Next section's on embracing sexuality, and he says, Let me give you an example. 
I was rejected by this one girl that I really, really liked, which originally sent me to this forum four years ago. Now I'm going out with her. She's the perfect example of the beautiful, innocent type. So what could I do? You can't just go up and start grabbing things. You have to create intimacy with the beautiful, innocent type through desire. Let her know you want her. And the guy asked Puck, like, didn't you just say you ought to be desireless? He goes, well, when you were a nice guy, how were you showing your desire? Flowers, declarations of love, by talking to her all day? A romantic machine is broken when that happens, and the only way to fix it is to turn off our desire. Okay, now we aren't doing any of these stupid sappy things. Now we have to rebuild the romantic machine. Replace it with something like the anti-dump machine. And look that up if you haven't seen it already, guys. It's actually a pretty interesting way to uh, not overinvest in girls. It stood the test of time. Uh, continuing here, though. Now, when your romantic she machine gets turned back on, you do not display your desire on the scene channels, like flowers, gifts, chocolate, poetry, but through the unseen stuff. Eye contact, voice tone, getting to the point, etc. I like this section because you're going to see, and it's not just within, like this was an old pickup thing, but you're going to see this within the red pill, within pickup. Things, you can't just follow them. I had a video on a mids watch here about going Rambo and what that means. And this is essentially it. Everything sh should be taken literally unless it's not to be taken literally. And the only way to know is to use your damn noggin. For a lot of techniques, a lot of strategies, a lot of mindset shifts, a lot of mental models you're going to find that they're contradictory for the new guys as to the old guys. You'll find as you get experience, you can kind of break some rules that were sacrosanct six months ago, and that's just part of the process. In this case, he's like, yeah, don't show desire because that makes that makes you look needy. It's not because desire makes you look needy. It's just the average guy who doesn't know how to date only knows how to work with that broken set of models there. So you break it down before you build it back up. Have the guy just stop showing desire. Stop being uh, forward with his intentions or start being forward with his intentions. Stop having dinner dates. Stop doing this. And you're going to see like most of the stuff when you guys learn this, it's always about don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And then when that's all gone, then you can start adding tools to your repertoire. So for this one, you're going to see a lot of contradiction on here, which is absolutely fine. Just realize it's not a contradiction. You're just not ready yet. Eliminate desire or not. And Pook gives a story. Years ago, when I first came to the forum, I was a nice guy. And how am I going to get woman? Well, one thing I said back then was Kino. I said it because it worked. If you guys don't know, Kino means like to, to, like touching. Forearm touching, shoulder touching, brushing back people's hair. Kino. And I said it because it worked. Kinoing means you turn into a sexual being to her. If you do not Kino her, you will see yourself sexually as a mannequin. Why? Because mannequins do not instigate Kino. And then years later, he says, I don't Kino chicks. Certainly not on first dates. And somebody thinks he's got a gotcha. Contradiction. Pook's contradicting himself. And what you've forgotten is after all these years, I am no longer that old nice guy. The nice guy crumbs across to warm women as boring and sexually a zero. Nice guys are safe. So when I started Kinoing and stuff, I got an instant reaction from her. Why? because all of a sudden I was a sexual being. Now the one difference from those old nice guy days or those old nice guy days is I've gained 30 pounds of muscle, I dress better, I talk better, I'm more confident, I am already a sexual being. If I start kinoing a girl now, I'll be seen as coming on too strong and too desperate. And that's now why I agree with the anti-dump machine. I'm not for or against kino, I also wouldn't recommend nice guys to act like I am now. So now I disregard talking about Kino or how you say things and just talk about sexuality. I'm already a sexual being. There's no need for me to Kino a girl. She will know I'm being sexual already and I don't need to touch her. But the nice guy needs to embrace his sexuality because he is a sexual dud. You need to look, act, and think like a guy. I like this. I like this a lot. I kind of experienced it myself. I've talked about it many times and back in my early 20s. When I was in uh, the military, I did pick up. It was fun. Killed a lot of time, and I didn't have a lot of time to waste. So it was a nice way to kind of make dating into a game so I wouldn't get too bored and frustrated with it, end up married to some dependipotamus. The point is, the things that I learned when I first started were absolutely vital to me. When I had very little experience dating, I wasn't very good at it. But as I got better with it, I started to notice I started skipping steps. I started skipping uh, techniques. 
I didn't have to tell stories. Sometimes success just fell into my lap. And so you're going to find all tools are subjective. All tools are conditional. Maybe it'll work today. Maybe it won't work tomorrow. So what you're really doing here is you're not learning specific techniques on how to get the girls, as Aaron Clary puts it. What you're learning is a way to adapt to a situation. You want to signal that you're a sexual person to somebody when you're first dating them because you want to see if you're sexually compatible. Great. How do you do that? Well, it's either all about you. It's about acting one way. It's about looking one way. It's about dressing one way. It's about talking a certain way. It's about eye contact. And some things you have and some things you don't. And there's things you can use to uh, supplement that. So if you're missing a lot of those natural talents, yeah, Kino Escalation kind of get the point across. It's Maybe it's a little ham-fisted, but it's more successful than just going home and jerking off in your living room. But once you get things together, once you start putting on muscle mass, once you start acting more attractive, once you stop acting less unattractive, you're going to notice that these tools largely aren't required anymore. And that's okay. Just don't try to kick the ladder out from under you because a lot of guys who are coming up and just starting out probably need them themselves. On shyness. This is why before you can start to date women, you must be able to date yourself. That's right. Date yourself. Try going out to places by yourself or with your friends first. This will make you more comfortable because you already know the place, you're comfortable with it, and what to expect. This is important because when you're new with a girl and all, it's enough to be a shy guy to be out with girls, let alone in a new and strange place. This will make your job easier. Makes you prepared. You can speak of the places or where you want to go with confidence and the ease. You know the route, the best way to get there. You know the cost, the environment, so you know how much money to take and what to wear. For the shy guys wishing they were girls and somebody else would take them on dates and take the lead, this is why you should be thankful that you're the guy. You get to know beforehand where you want to go and what you want to do so you have all the time in the world to be prepared. It also makes you have fun. So with you being comfortable, with you being prepared, already your time will be more enjoyable. Since you have all those shy guys, worries, putting away, the wear, the cost, the environment, so on, you get to focus on her and have fun with her. This one is nice because a lot of guys are confused. Like they focused, and this was like big on the pickup thing. They focused so much on getting a girl's number that once they got it, they were like, oh, I don't know what to do. I got to call her the next day. And it's like cold calling somebody trying to sell them Amway product or some crap like that. Yeah, uh, have places you like going to. And then even if it's not a date, like for example, I always had a lounge I love to go to. It's a place called Glow. It was on the waterfront nearby my place. I knew the staff there. They knew me. It was close to where I went golfing. So if I go golfing, like, hey, when I'm done, you can come join me at this place and have a little quick date. And if things go well, we can go to the bar afterwards. But you see my point there? I know everybody. Everybody knows me. It gets pre-selection. I don't have to worry about anything. I know about how much dinner and drinks cost. So I know how much money I need to bring. I know the kind of clothes I need to wear. So all these things kind of put you at ease. So you can focus on being in the moment. Fail to plan, plan to fail. Big and finally, we end off on the nature of sexuality. This, he's bringing up a bunch of internet arguments that he's had with a bunch of guys. And this was like the standard one. You're probably going to recognize his argument too, where the guy says like, chicks get off on power. Why do you think they go for the jocks and dudes with the defined pecs and the six packs and not some flabby, terrible poetry spouting loser like you? Power, baby. And Puck's like, this is absolutely not true. Even when I was scrawny, I still scored chicks with my poetry. But it wasn't my poetry. It was my imagination that reeled him in. Musicians also get laid. And he's like, no, they do get off on power, but they also get off on other things. And that's how that jobless, starving artist can be with that hottie. It's because he's dreamy. About women wanting the best in life they can get and choosing the guys who give it the best of them. That's a section here where guys are talking about hypergamy, essentially, where they think girls are always there to upgrade. And the instant that somebody has more money, they're going to leave you for him and monkey branch swing and all this crap you see. So I guarantee if you've been watching MGTOW channels, you probably know exactly what he's on about here. And again, this was like 15 years ago, man. Pokes like, no, that's definitely not true too. Women make incredibly stupid choices when choosing who to marry. For that can seem like an infinite number of reasons that they choose that defy explanation since each situation is unique. And this, to me, accounts for the incredibly high divorce rate in this country. And everybody's laughing. It's like, well, rationally, this guy's got better things on paper. This and he's like, who said women judged men rationally? In her mind, 
That loser is not a loser. He's a spontaneous, exciting person who adds to her dull life. Now, women will have anything. Happiness, sadness, horror, fear, joy, laughter, but they will not tolerate one thing. Boredom. They may even see the loser for what he is. Then they think, I'll turn this guy around. He'll become successful because of me. This stupid female vanity lets women marry the loser despite everybody's advice to the contrary. And then the final question is, if you say that is true, then how come people divorce so much? And he's just... Excessive expectations. So here's the thing to think about. And this is this has been my take on it. Stop taking advice about sex from guys who aren't getting any. They're absolutely clueless. They tend to steal stuff from random pickup forum, forums, random MRA forums, random feminist blogs from like 20 years ago and have no idea how people came to that conclusion. They have no experience and they hodgepodge it together in some weird incel fan fiction. And it's just ridiculous. So yeah, girls have their own set of values and things they value. It may not be the same things you value. And just because a guy looks good to you on paper doesn't mean it looks good to her in reality. They're emotional creatures, so they're going to use emotional things here. And like I said, keep coming back to that. Boredom matters a lot. Inflated expectations are why divorces may happen, but boredom is why you get that initial attraction. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Catch you next weekend. I can't think of an ender, so cheers. Cheers.